Last year I did a 5,000 mile review on this FLSL Softail Slim. It was a pretty long review, about 20 minutes. Since then I've put another 10,000 miles on this bike. And some of my opinions from that first video have changed a little bit. Some of them haven't. So I'm going to do a 15,000 mile review. This one will not take nearly as long. Then after I get done with the review, I'll talk about another project I've got going on to hit some of the highlight areas of the state of Texas. I'll tell you about the geography here, some of the history here, what makes this road in this section of the state unique, and uh, give you a little tour for those of you who haven't been down here, haven't been down here yet, or will never make it down here. And for those of you who are curious, this is a road that runs from just south of Llano past Enchanted Rock and on into Fredericksburg. Now since I've had the bike, I put a crash bar on it. That's the first thing I put on it. Also put on some LED lights, put on a sissy bar for to strap day packs and backpacks on for trips like this. Put on some foot pegs. I put on some RCX uh, slash slip-ons on this bike. And I went with the RCX mainly because of the West End Motorsports video, which characterized them as loud but not obnoxiously loud. And my experience has proven that basically to be true. I can control them in the neighborhoods. Uh, they are loud, have a loud growl and rumble when you get out on the highway. But they are loud enough that I wear foam earplugs now if I'm going to be out on a trip more than about 30 minutes. Probably should have been doing that anyway to preserve what's left of my hearing. But nevertheless, these pipes have nudged me into doing what I should have been doing in the first place. The most important thing that I've done to the bike that's different is I put a Saddlement Road Sofa seat on it in that first video. I complained bitterly about how uncomfortable that factory seat was. And the first time I uh, did this video, I completely forgot to mention that seat. Last year, I took this Saddlement seat down to Port Aransas from Dallas, about a seven hour drive each way. I could not have done that with the factory seat. It would have been miserable to even try it. And I also took it up to the Bring It Home record. Uh, there's an Alamo right there, Motif, Texas. And the day after this video was shot, I spent 10 hours on the bike. And I'm not gonna say my ass was singing like a gospel choir, because it was uncomfortable. Towards the end of the day, I was shifting around and uh, I was ready to get off after 10 hours. There's no way I could have done that with the factory seat. So again, the fact that I forgot to even mention it means the seat is doing exactly what it's supposed to do. You shouldn't have to think about how much your ass hurts while you're riding down the road enjoying the scenery. Now, the Settlement Road Sofa does change your riding position a little bit. You're a little bit forward and a little bit higher than you are in the factory seat. When I say a little bit, you're noticeably forward and noticeably higher. And while I like the riding position of the factory seat, I do not miss it. Um, when you consider the comfort of the saddlement. One thing I complained about in the first review, the 5,000 mile review, was the lack of aftermarket for these bikes. And the aftermarket is still slim for the soft tail slim, but it hasn't been near the inconvenience that I was worried it was gonna be. For example, in the first video, I talked about an oil temperature gauge. The reason I was considering getting an oil temperature gauge was in stop and go traffic in the Dallas area and the Texas summer heat. Sometimes I wondered just how hot the engine oil was getting and whether it got hot enough that I needed to start putting synthetic in it. With the 10,000 mile oil change, I just went synthetic anyway. And since I went synthetic, that eliminates the whole uh, reason I was thinking about getting an oil temperature gauge to begin with. The sissy bar strapping uh, backpacks on for trips like this has worked just fine. Saddlebags aren't an issue for me, at least harder locking saddlebags right now. At one point I was wondering if I needed to get different handlebars, eight hangers or something for road trips. And these Hollywood bars, I've gotten used to them. I don't even think about them, except for right now when I was trying to think of things that I wanted to get last year. So the aftermarket has proven to be less of an issue than I really thought it was gonna be. I like the bike just the way it is. At one point I was thinking about getting a windshield, but I got a helmet that has a face shield on it, and that works out fine for me. I actually like the wind blowing. When I take a look at this creek right now, that, that granite on the creek is going to come up in the story after the review. 
So that's uh, not been a problem for me. The aftermarket has just not been needed because the bike is so good the way it is. One other thing I talked about in the first video is the spoked wheels, and I talked about how uh, they may not be the best for being out in the roads where there's no self perception and hardly any traffic, which does not apply to this road, by the way. But um, that still applies. One thing I would point out is if you've never dealt with spoke wheels before, they do require maintenance. If you're going to wrench the bike yourself, you have to go get a torque wrench or a spoke torque wrench. Check the tension on your spokes because they do go out of spec. Every service I do, uh, I have to mess with spokes. And interesting enough, in the YouTube videos that I was watching learning how to do this, they mentioned that the rear wheel was going to be the one that required more attention because you've got the forces of acceleration and deceleration. And on this bike, it's proven to be the, the front wheel that's been more of a diva that requires more attention and maintenance. But again, it takes a little time. Get a sport with spoke wrench, sit down, get you something to drink, jack up the bike, get to work. It's not that big a deal. Other than that, the last 10,000 miles I put on since my first video, I really don't have much bad to say about the bike. It's proven to be a great way to go see the state, go see scenery like this, visit different parts of the state. It has given me no bad habits whatsoever. It's been enjoyable. And so really the amendment to my 5,000 mile review is that the disadvantages and things I said I didn't like have actually, I've actually dialed them back a little bit. And everything I said I like still pertains today. So that's my 15,000 mile review outlook. I told you now, I would tell you a little bit about the road off in the distance. It's called Enchanted Rock. I'll tell you some stories and the history about that in a little bit. Right now we're in the Llano Uplift part of the Texas Hill Country, which is on the very northern edge of the Texas Hill Country. One of the things that makes this area unique is that, and we already saw at the creek, just underneath the dirt here, uh, which is very shallow, is pink granite. This whole area is pink granite. There's pink granite outcroppings and this uh, enchanted rock, this large monolith in the distance. Even the soil here that's shallow and minerally, it's got pink granite sand. There's really no farm in here. It's mostly livestock and grazing. And what kind of caricatures or stereotypes, if you're not from the state of Texas, you have about folks from Texas. Uh, but the Texas State Capitol building in Austin is made from granite that was mined in this area of the state a little bit east of here. And so the Texas State Capitol building is actually pink. So if you want, you can pause the video a second and insert your own joke here. Now it's hard to get a real scale of the size of Enchanted Rock on this video. This camera is set to ultra wide angle, which means everything in the distance is much smaller than it is in real life. I'm gonna turn the bike around here in a second. I'll take a, uh, a uh, picture with a more or less a normal lens and also a telephoto lens and you'll see that the enchanted rock comes out much bigger than it looks in this video. In fact the video itself might actually look better if you're watching it on a computer screen that's set to full screen mode as opposed to a cell phone. Enchanted Rock itself is a whole country icon. Lots of people come here to climb it like mountaineers. If you want to do that though you have to make reservations pretty far in advance. You can't just drive up and expect to be let in because they limit the number of people they allow in every day. And there is a reservation system in place. Human civilization here at Enchanted Rock has been around for at least 10,000 years. And this part of the state in more recent history was Comanche territory. There is a book by Herman Lehman about uh, his time when he was a young boy, not very far from this very video. He was kidnapped by an Apache raiding party and inducted into Apache tribe. He eventually ended up uh, transferring over to the Comanches for several reasons, one of which involved a spat he had with a medicine man. One of the things I remember him saying or when I was reading the book is he talked about how the Comanches were actually they had a better sense of humor, they were more prone to fun, they were just more laid back and more fun to be with than the Apache tribe, which is very different characterization than other people.
people from that era that lived here that wrote about the Comanches, they did not have those kinds of good things to say about the Comanche uh, nation. The book is called Nine Years Among the Indians. I'll put a link down below. I don't get any money off of it. It's got four and a half stars out of five on Amazon with more than 400 reviews, so I'm not the only one that thought it was a good book. Before I go into the legends about Enchanted Rock, I will say uh, that this area of the state, one of the most prominent features of this area of the state is that it has one of the densest deer populations in North America. There's areas of this, this region where the deer density is one deer per three acres. If you come down here in the evening or the morning time, you'll see herds and herds of deer up and down the roads. Now the deer here aren't very big. Uh, they're referred to by hunters derisively as, you know, dog size, but they are everywhere along with lots of turkey, quail, dove, and other things that people like to hunt or just sit out on the porch and drink iced tea and see. Uh, this is not a road or a region that you want to be out on a motorcycle at dusk or dawn or at night. It would just be too dangerous. In fact, I wanted to come back later on and take some pictures in the sunset, but there's just no way with that many deer on this stretch of road in this area of the state that it's even safe to, to think about. The only other part of the United States I've heard of that has a deer density similar to this is some parts of Alabama, uh, but it's not even close to the densest areas here in this part of the hill country in Texas. And here's some photos that show some more realistic views as, long as, as well as a telephoto that shows the scale and size of Enchanted Rock. Be right back to the video. There's lots of legends as to why it's called Enchanted Rock. The first one I was told as a kid was that it was called Enchanted Rock because uh, when water would get stuck after a rain up in the crevices or pockets of the uh, rock at night when it was a full moon, it would reflect the moonlight off sporadically in small pools. And from a distance, it looked like ghosts or spirits were up on the rock, haunting the rock. Enchanted Rock's probably been a holy or sacred or haunted place as long as there's been people around. But there are other legends about Enchanted Rock. For example, one is uh, allegedly, uh, it was an old Indian legend that if you climbed Enchanted Rock and did your meditations up there, you would become invisible to your enemies. Uh, another legend is, is that if you uh, don't purify yourself and go with a pure motives when you climb the rock if you get up to the top you just brought yourself bad luck and bad juju possibly even death and another thing is if you're at a time of year where there's a long large fluctuation between temperatures and day and night time the uneven and heating and cooling of the rock causes uh, sounds to come from the rock that is a distant sound like moans or ghostly sounds which also probably contribute to the stories. There's a lot of stories about Enchanted Rock that would be appropriate for a campfire along with some s'mores, especially if you were camping somewhere right near the rock. Years ago I was reading an old history book that talked about a guy who was by Enchanted Rock that a band of Comanches, a small band of Comanches caught him. So they uh, provoked him somehow to fire his pistol. And as soon as he fired his pistol, the group jumped up and charged him because they were used to muzzle loaders with one shot, not realizing that this guy had this newfangled invention called a revolver, and he was able to get off five more shots and kill his attackers. But that's hardly the only gun battle or Indian fight that's made it famous. Anybody who studies the uh, history of Native Americans in Texas, there's been uh, quite a few Indian battles that have been fought here. And finally, one last thing that makes this area unique, or not one last thing, there's many areas, but one last thing in this video that makes this area of the state unique is, if you get online and you look at ranches for sale in this part of the state, which is served by the Hickory Aquifer, a lot of times you'll see an uh, innocent looking sentence down on the bottom that says this land is, uh, overlays the Hickory Aquifer. Information for the Hickory Aquifer is available at and we'll give you a link. And you may think the realtor is trying to be nice and show you and uh, refer you to a source that tells you how deep the water table is and how far you'll have to drill through the pink granite to get to uh, 
water for a well. But that's actually uh, a lawyer that probably made them put that in there. And the reason for that is the Hickory Aquifer, the water that comes out of the Hickory Aquifer is mildly radioactive. Underground there's a lot of radium and dissolved radium and radon gas that comes out of the aquifer water. And the aquifer is used as a water source, I believe, for the city of Llano and also for the city of Fredericksburg. And every now and then, uh, somebody on the news or somebody will point out a paper saying, hey, this water is you know, mildly radioactive. And, but the reality is, what do you do? People have been living here for hundreds of years. And you know, this is such a popular part of the state, they're not gonna just scrape all the cities off and relocate folks other way, elsewhere. I believe I read somewhere that Fredericksburg is trying to start importing water from somewhere else on a pipeline. But if you drink it, you're not gonna get Superman powers or Spider-Man powers. Uh, but over long term, there folks really aren't sure what the exposure risks are. Uh, one other thing to note is, is if you have a place out here, for example, if you have uh, galvanized steel piping that you use for a long period of time with the hickory aquifer water and it starts to get corroded or rusted. The pipes themselves become so radioactive that they are actually radioactive waste and they have to be disposed of as radioactive waste. Here in the Dallas area, at some of the scrap yards, I've seen uh, radiation detectors as you go in. And when I asked about them, they said they were there. There's some white elk over there, an albino elk behind the high gang fence. At any rate, when I asked the uh, folks about the detectors, what they said was uh, to stop people from bringing in uh, x-ray machine material. But another thing that they specifically mentioned was people bringing in water pipes and things from the Texas Hill Country from the Hickory Aquifer. Because once they make it into the metal yard, it becomes the metal yard's uh, expensive problem to deal with. Now you might think mildly radioactive water, that's a deal breaker. And sir, you would be wrong. There's lots of ornery old folks here that say there's nothing wrong with the water. Uh, probably the same folks that uh, drink a glass of water while smoking cigarettes and drinking whiskey. But the weather and the rainfall, this is a greener area of the hill country than other parts of the hill country. The abundant wildlife makes this an iconic place and folks who have lots of money and lots of means will make it a point to buy a ranch by Lano or Fredericksburg because it's a status symbol. To be able to say I've got a ranch and by Fredericksburg or by Lano is the equivalent of somebody from Colorado or California saying I've got a place in Aspen. So that's my review and if you've made it this far in the video, thanks for coming along. Let me introduce you to a unique place in a unique state in the United States. If you ever make it down here on a bike, make sure to take this road. This is one of the iconic motorcycle roads in this part of the state. And if you aren't gonna make it down here, I'll see you on the highways and the byways of the state of Texas.